This is gonna be a food fight. Dateline continues in a moment. Good evening and welcome to Dateline. I'm Stone Phillips. For some parents, the toughest job at mealtime is getting their children to eat more. But these days, for many parents, the problem is getting kids to eat less. Childhood obesity is a growing problem in this country. Nearly one out of five American children is overweight. Convincing kids to eat right can be a battle. And some critics say the food industry has turned it into an unfair fight. Tonight, the industry fights back. But we begin with America's love-hate relationship with food and why we eat so much. We go to McDonald's every day in the morning for breakfast and we go for lunch. Every day, no fail. I remember crying as a little kid because I didn't get to go and get my happy meal. I remember sobbing about it. <laughs> They'll have a shopping cart full of SpongeBob, Spider-Man, <laughs> Scooby-Doo. Tony the Tiger, they're great. They are great. <laughs> Did you think it was healthy? Well, we knew it wasn't healthy, no. but it was convenient. If you are a parent struggling to keep your children from becoming obese, you might sometimes feel surrounded, outnumbered, outgunned. I don't think our parents know what the hell to do. I think we're one of the most obese generations there has been ever. And there is cause for concern. Today's children are the first generation of Americans in 200 years projected to have a shorter lifespan than their parents, with one out of three at risk of developing type 2 diabetes in their lifetime, a crippling disease once only seen in adults. Who's to blame? Most people say we are. We choose what we eat. But a growing number of advocates, nutritionists, and lawyers are taking the struggle from the food court to the court of law. They want to sue the companies that make and market what's on your plate. Is this just the latest example of a lawsuit happy society shirking responsibility? Or are lawsuits a powerful weapon to combat this nation's obesity epidemic? A lawsuit filed in federal court in New York alleges that McDonald's has made children overweight and unhealthy. American fast food, what a stupid way to die. In August 2002, two girls from the Bronx, New York, gobbling supersized meals almost every day, sued McDonald's, accusing the company of making them sick and obese. The reaction was a big round of belly laughs. Yeah, a spokesman um, for McDonald's said they really don't mind the lawsuit since any money they pay these kids will probably wind up back at McDonald's. <laughs> these people thought it was a joke. We convened several groups of Americans whose weight puts them at the center of this crisis. What do you think of suing the food industry for creating the obesity epidemic in this country? It's ridiculous. They're just suing them just to get money. These men and women routinely eat at the McDonald's sued by the Bronx girls. Nobody pushed them to go. Nobody said, listen, if you don't go get that Big Mac we'll meal, you. <laughs> you're going to jail. I was eating food. Most consumers agree that what you eat is your choice, so it's a matter of personal responsibility. But several academics and lawyers are arguing that you're far less free to choose what's on your plate than you realize. Whose fault is it? that so many Americans are fat. Fault is a hard word, but a large part of it is the restaurant industry and the fast food industry. John Banzaff is a law professor at George Washington University. He started thinking about obesity soon after the U.S. Surgeon General called it a national epidemic. And it didn't take long before Banzaff came up with his cure. If you had your way, would junk food be illegal? No, I certainly am not interested in prohibiting anyone the adult at least from eating any kind of food that they want but Banzap hopes lawsuits will force the fast food industry to disclose on the menu board just how fattening the food is restaurants do not have to list calories the way the makers of packaged foods do but Banzap says they should he also wants it to be required that fast food outlets offer more nutritious alternatives and he wants health warnings to greet you every time you pull up or walk in to order. Suppose you were walking into McDonald's and you saw a big warning that said, warning, eating fast food frequently 
can lead to obesity, which doubles your risk of a heart attack. But where does that lead us? Doesn't that lead to warnings about everything? Beware of that necktie you're wearing because you could pull it too tight and choke yourself? We can take any legal principle and carry it to an illogical extreme. But modern law recognizes that balanced against personal responsibility is corporate responsibility. That was the idea behind anti-tobacco litigation. 30 years ago, Banzaf was among the first to suggest suing cigarette makers to curb smoking. Sure, smokers chose to smoke, but companies failed to warn them of just how addictive cigarettes could be. And that cost the industry billions and billions of dollars. Is junk food the next tobacco? I think junk food and perhaps even other foods are the next tobacco. Benzep argues the food and tobacco industries are alike in many ways. For decades, tobacco giants employed scientists, marketers, and lobbyists to downplay the health threat of smoking. Now, Benzef says, food companies are doing much the same thing with obesity. And he says both have hidden behind that catchphrase, personal responsibility, which he calls a big fat red herring. It's hard to believe that just over the last 20 years, which, when, which is when this epidemic started, that somehow we all lost personal responsibility. Because if we did, we'd have far more automobile accidents, far more accidental shootings, and so on. We don't see that. So what did change? Not us, Banzaf says, just everything around us. More Americans work out of the house and longer hours, so we become more dependent on meals we don't cook ourselves. And in the past two decades, fast food companies have ramped up production and marketing to compete for our dining dollars expanding outlets, hours, and portions. Fast food is now everywhere, all the time, and cheap. All our panelists say personal responsibility is key, but they admit they feel bombarded and boxed in. You can't go anywhere without, you know, a fast food restaurant being right on the next corner. They're targeting us. They're targeting our children, targeting our society. It's cheap, it's easy, it's terminally greasy, it's fast, 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 fast food. That's exactly what that lawsuit against McDonald's argued. The two Bronx girls claimed the Golden Arches targeted them as kids, deceptively advertising the food as nutritious and never disclosing what's really in it. So what happened? In 2003, a judge ruled the teens failed to link their obesity directly to McDonald's. He threw the lawsuit out. You cannot just pick one thing and say, this is the root cause of this person's obesity. Minneapolis attorney Joe Price is studying the issue of obesity, preparing for future lawsuits. He's an expert in this sort of product litigation. His firm defends the food industry. Price says that unlike the direct link between cigarette smoking and lung cancer, no one can prove that a certain food or food chain made them obese. Obesity, after all, is caused by many factors, not just food. There's that couch and that family tree. There are people who can go out and eat McDonald's five times a week and never put on a pound. And as the judge in the McDonald's case wrote, the law can't protect people from their own excesses. People, if you ask them today, will tell you that they make the decision what they eat, and they make that decision for their children. Even so, the judge in the McDonald's case didn't totally dismiss the idea that customers may be misled, opening the door for future lawsuits tossing lawyers like Banzaf a legal McNugget. What he said is, chicken McNuggets are a McFrankenstein creation. Many people think chicken is healthier than beef. They are misled because it's a McFrankenstein creation. The way they make it with all these weird ingredients, it has twice the fat and twice the calories of their cheeseburgers. But nobody's forcing us to eat fast food or to eat so much of it. No, but if a fast food restaurant doesn't tell you in an effective manner what's in the food. In fact, if people are confused, thinking, for example, a chicken McNuggets because their chicken is healthier than the hamburgers, people can't make those choices. Banzaf calls that consumer fraud and a way to get to court. If I can go in there and show that a company misrepresented a product, I can sue on that basis alone and never have to prove that a single person became obese. <laughs> They changed the McNuggets, you know. McDonald's changed the recipe of its chicken McNuggets, replacing the unfamiliar ingredients listed by the judge with familiar and leaner all-white meat. Change is good. Still, that lawsuit against the Golden Arches hasn't gone away. 
Last year, an appellate court ruled that it could proceed after all, and it's pending. This food fight may just be getting started. What does McDonald's have to say? We'll hear from one of the company's top executives a little later. But first, from battles in court to the fight on the home front, getting your kids to eat right. We'll show you just how persuasive marketing with the right stars can be. This for breakfast. This when Food Fight continues. Blaming fast food for America's childhood obesity epidemic can be as convenient as your neighborhood drive through It's also easy to say that parents should guide their kids to make better choices. But what if we told you that some food companies are targeting your children using techniques you might not suspect? We found out just how powerful those methods can be when we conducted our own taste test. A banana or a rock? Which would your child pick for breakfast? You're really choosy. Once upon a time, food commercials targeted mom. It tastes more like fresh peanuts. Choosy mothers choose Jif. That was a long time ago. Have it your way. Ah. Just crunch the taste you can see. Today, food marketing aimed directly at children is a $10 billion industry. And two-thirds of Americans say it's a major contributor to childhood obesity. Kids are bombarded with marketing. From the moment they get up in the morning to the moment they go to bed at night. Harvard psychologist Susan Lin calls it brainwashing and wants it to end. So she has joined with concerned parents and advocacy groups to serve notice that they intend to sue cereal makers and children's TV channels for marketing unhealthy food to kids. You know, there's no moral, ethical, or social justification for marketing junk food to kids. I mean, it's not good for them. We know that kids are vulnerable to marketing. A typical child sees some 17,000 commercials a year for fast food, candy, soft drinks, and sweetened breakfast cereals. Do you think food advertising to children ought to be banned on television? Yes. 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 So they're little kids. They don't know that what they're putting into their body is going to, in the end, hurt them. But TV is just the beginning. Pepsi and Coke, they both say that they do not market to children, I think, under the age of 12. And there is a Pepsi car for kids as young as four. Yeah, age four and up, right. says right here on the back. Yes. Food is turned into toys, or attached to toys, or just squirts out like a toy. The food plate and the toy shelf are starting to look a lot alike. It's a merger, yeah. And then there's the internet. But now on Postopia, you A growing number of popular online gaming sites are owned or sponsored by the food industry. So they have the whole Nabisco site. My, my little brother's 13 and could live on that website. Like, you just play, and it's like all the different all snack food. foods, but it's like I know, yeah, crazy I know games. I mean, they're fun games. Children spend hours on these sites, exposed to what critics slam as stealth advertising, slipping past parents to reach the kids. And you know what the industry does that is so distressing is that they really prey on parents' best intentions. Like encouraging kids to read or learn math. These are books. The M&M's book looks just like a box of M&M's. Companies say it helps kids learn, and there's nothing wrong with that. Can we get new cereal? But critics argue that the companies actually make a concerted effort not to help parents, but to pit kids against parents. In 1998, this company called Western Media International did a study on nagging. It was not a study to help parents cope with nagging. It was a study to help corporations help children nag more effectively. How many of you have heard the term nag factor or pester power? These are actual marketing terms for targeting children so that they will to you. Bug their parents <laughs> right. until you break down and buy them what they want. Now, I will break down quicker than she will. So they come to, they come to dad knowing that you will give in. Mm -hmm. I'm guilty. <laughs> and many parents say this is the ultimate battleground. Point of sale. Beware. The gauntlet of the cereal aisle. A lot of familiar faces. Black, Shrek is over right, here. Right. Tigger's up here. Nemo, Bat Dora. Batman. The guy from Toy Story. Exactly. Barbie, of course. And SpongeBob. SpongeBob SquarePants. Madison Avenue calls them spokes characters. Their licensing has become an enormous business. Shrek, Scooby, 
Batman, we discovered the enormous sway these spokes characters have with kids. What's your name, sweetheart? Nadia. Nadia, please have a seat. When we sent NBC's Hoda Kotb to a preschool in New Rochelle, New York, a consultant in child education helped us devise a little game. First, we asked three and four-year-olds to choose between a cupcake with the American flag and one with a familiar cartoon character. This cupcake or this cupcake? Mm. You think it tastes better than this one? Yeah. It does? How do you know? Hi, you silly, silly goose. This one's because, um, I like Spider-Man. It saves the world. He saves the world? Yeah. Why do you like that one better? Because it's Spider-Man. Almost all the kids picked a character over the red, white, and blue. So we upped the ante and went for the battle parents lose all the time, a fattening dessert versus fruit. We asked these preschoolers to choose between a cupcake and a banana. This time, we recruited Scooby and Shrek to pitch the fruit. Why do you like the banana better than the cupcake? I like Shrek. This one. <laughs> this banana. Most went with what Shrek and company seemed to endorse. So finally, to see just how far these characters could sway kids, we asked, what would they rather have for breakfast? A banana or a rock? We decorated the rock this time. A rock? No. I may have cereal. A rock. I have Scooby-Doo. SpongeBob. Do you like SpongeBob? Which would you rather have for breakfast? For breakfast. This one. For breakfast. This one. Scooby Dooby Doo. Where are you? Guys, seem like you now. It seems pretty clear companies can count on Scooby Doo when they've got some work to do. An overwhelming majority went straight for the rock. We yeah. grew up with. Tony the Tiger, we and did. Captain Crunch, and we Sugar did. Bear, and now it's Elmo, or now it's it's Shrek. I mean, what, why is it so different? It's changed in volume and intensity and sophistication. That's what's different. It's not just advocates saying this. A recent 18-month study by the Institute of Medicine concluded that today's food advertising to children influences kids to make poor diet choices. How tough has the food industry made it for parents? Tough. They made Very it so hard. tough. Tough. In the face of mounting criticism, food makers and marketers are responding. Food companies are reviewing their policies, and advertisers have asked the industry's self-monitoring board to come up with clear guidelines about how to market snack foods and sweets to kids. Still, critics point out that the ad industry's review board has no enforcement power. But isn't, isn't the choice of what to buy and feed kids up to parents? ultimately it's easy to blame parents it's not a level playing field i mean how can one family take on a 10 to 12 billion dollar industry that's you know food marketing to kids by, how can they do it by saying no right. by doing what they ought to do as parents it's hard to keep saying no over and over and over i mean it's hard to be a parent why are we letting food companies make it that much more difficult especially when there's so much at stake i mean the health of our children when we come back, one reason why fattening food may be so hard for some to resist, and it's not advertising. Some scientists are studying whether certain foods could be addictive. The brain is responding to food in a nearly identical manner as it is responding to cocaine. When Food Fight continues. If you've struggled with your weight, you know how hard it is to resist high-fat, high-calorie food. You probably think it's your own fault and the lack of willpower. But there's intriguing new scientific research that in your battle of the bulge, the scales may be weighted against you. You can sum up this food fight in one question. Are we fat because we're not trying hard enough to eat well? or because somehow the food industry has eroded our ability to just say no. Back in the 90s, lawyers suing cigarette makers clinched their case by proving smokers found it hard to quit, not for lack of will, but because nicotine was addictive. 
Now some of the same lawyers are pointing to similar preliminary but tantalizing findings about your burgers and fries. How many of you feel that fattening foods are addictive? I'm Arlene, and I am a food addict. From Flour, candy to potato chips to cookies to pepperoni. And I could not stop eating. I just knew I had a problem. Cream and then pepperoni again. And My tolerance for pasta is unending. Brownies and donuts and cookies and cakes and Once pies. I eat just some of it, I just crave more. From the days of reefer madness, that old anti-drug movie, the word addiction has conjured images of out-of-control behavior. And no burger will make you do this. <laughs> but today, cutting-edge science is shedding new light on addiction and its connection to chemical changes in the brain. If those changes can lead to compulsive behavior, well, some scientists wonder if fatty foods and drugs just might have more in common than you think. We're very early in the game when it comes to addiction to food. The evidence is beginning to line up that there are so many similarities that I think we're going to see that there are patients who are addicted to food. Dr. William Jacobs studies addiction at the University of Florida and has testified against cigarette makers in past tobacco cases. He points to these brain images. See the red and yellow? That indicates increased activity in our brain's reward and pleasure centers. It's our brain demanding, give me more. Look at how the red and yellow increases when a cocaine addict ingests the drug. The more he gets, the more he wants. Now look at the brain of an obese person before and after they ingest their favorite food. What that really tells us is that the brain is responding to food in a nearly identical manner as it is responding to cocaine in the patients who met criteria for food addiction. I have shrimp scampi for you. you smell that garlic and the shrimp. This may look a little odd, but these scientists at the prestigious Brookhaven National Lab are finding that just smelling and seeing certain foods can often trigger a chemical excitement in the brains of overeaters making them compulsively want it. How much do you like that shrimp? On a scale of 1 to 10? Yes. A 12. What it means is that the impulse to eat may come as much from our mind as our stomach. So the study is over. How do you feel? Very hungry. And it seems our brain gets most excited by the things that cause us so many problems. Sugar, salt, and fat. Scientists warn that our brain chemistry may actually change as we eat these foods, causing us to crave them even more. If as a child I eat very sweet, pleasurable foods instead of my vegetables that my mother wants me to eat, I may be setting myself up for brain changes that may be irreversible. As preliminary as much of this science is, it's all potential ammunition for lawyers like John Banzaff. Fast food companies fail to tell people that there is now sufficient evidence that eating fattening foods can cause addictive changes in the body. So do chocoholics and junk food junkies really exist? No, says the food industry. You have to eat to survive. You want to eat because it tastes good. Food is not an addicting substance. Food is not morphine. And the solution to the problem of obesity in America is not in litigation. Joe McMenamin is a lawyer and a medical doctor in Richmond, Virginia. His firm represents food companies, so he's studying the issue of food addiction. He's concluded that calling food addictive is speculative junk science. The behaviors of those who overeat simply don't resemble the behaviors of those who are truly addicted. In those that are addicted, we see altered mental status. We see abrupt and often impulsive behavior dangerous to the individual himself or to others. We see withdrawal when one is denied access to his drug of choice. Foods don't do that. So how does this chemical excitement in our brain influence our decision making as we pull into the drive through If there is such a thing as food addiction, are some foods more addictive than others? The scientists we spoke to said a lot more needs to be understood before any of them would feel comfortable calling food addictive as experts on the witness stand. Stay tuned. 
Up next, we'll hear from those under attack how companies are fighting back, changing their recipes, their menus, and their message. We think we can be part of the solution. When Food Fight continues. Tonight, we've seen how the latest front in the battle against obesity is in the courtroom. Lawyers planning to sue some food makers and marketers, accusing them of making people fat. But the food industry has also been busy, both in the kitchen and out. My colleagues and I are now planning lots more fat lawsuits. Companies can do it voluntarily or they can be sued. This time, if they don't listen, we'll sue them. As these threats grow louder, the food industry is fighting back, launching an intensive campaign to portray lawyers like John Banzaff as ambulance chasers. Like a cheeseburger, medium fries, uh, what the? How about a mega-sized lawsuit to go with those fries? Companies argue these lawsuits are frivolous, unnecessary. But just in case, in conferences like this, attorneys are gearing up to defend the industry. These cases are defensible. They can be won. They will be won. Attorney Joe Price says lawyers like John Banzaff may claim fast food is the next tobacco, but it really isn't. A moderate amount of smoking is bad for you. A moderate amount of eating is what we all should be doing. And big food is not about to repeat the mistakes of big tobacco. Instead of digging in its heels, many in the food industry are embracing their critics' ideas. Companies are voluntarily changing their products and marketing. And perhaps no company has been more aggressive about changing than the nation's largest food company, Kraft. This is Kraft's company store at its headquarters in Northfield, Illinois. I walk the aisles with Lance Friedman, Kraft's senior vice president in charge of global health and wellness. Over the past four years, the company known for Cheese Whiz, Kool-Aid, and Oreos says it has cut fat out of over 200 products, trimming over 30 billion calories including a sizable bite in one of my favorites. Is this is the one I like, right? Oh, okay. Honey made low fat graham crackers. Now this, this hats off to you. You know, people love to get the favorites they've had for years in a healthier form. Tastes great with milk? Just like the way you like it, right? <laughs> but tinkering with the classics of America's cupboard has proven anything but easy. Consider the case of the Oreo. Well, here we are. America's, America's favorite cookie. There, there, right on the label, it says it. <laughs> Born in 1912, the Oreo was the best-selling cookie of the 20th century. Oh! Oh! Oreo! But in 2003, a lawyer from California sued Kraft, demanding that the company stop selling the cookie to children because it contained trans fat, an unhealthy substance tied to high cholesterol and risk of heart attack. Immediately, Kraft announced it would remove the trans fat. The lawsuit was dropped, but Kraft's delicate work had just begun huge brand for you, the Oreo cookie. Was there, was there reluctance to tamper with a recipe that had been so successful and the ingredients? When we made our announcement in the middle of 2003 that we were going to undertake a broad range of new initiatives in health and wellness, we got a lot of calls from consumers to our 800 number. And there were two messages they sent. The first one was typically, we're glad you're doing this. And the second message was, don't mess with the taste of my Oreo. The company says it has spent over 100,000 hours of research to get trans fat out of products, and the new trans fat-free Oreo is now available on store shelves. Informal taste tests say the new cookie tastes pretty much the same. It's an Oreo. Last year, Kraft took another bold step, confronting the controversial issue of advertising to children. The people behind Dunkables, Lunchables, and Scooby-Doo Macaroni and Cheese pulled all TV and print ads geared towards kids, unless the products meet the company's sensible solution standards, a self-imposed set of health criteria. We're talking about overall about 10% of the products that, that Kraft makes. That's right, close to $3 billion in sales that will no longer be advertised to kids 6 to 11. Kraft says all of these initiatives are market-driven. It's what people want. But some say the company may be so diligent, in part because Kraft's majority owner, Altria, is also the makers of Philip Morris cigarettes. And they've been through this before. Tobacco companies have paid out billions of dollars as a result of anti-smoking lawsuits. Has the corporate experience 
in the tobacco wars influenced its thinking when it comes to the food front? You know, we're doing this for two reasons. One, because it's right for consumers, and two, because it's right for our business. With these changes, Kraft is hoping to set an example, showing that corporate responsibility can come without litigation. Who's ultimately responsible? Obesity and trying to address it, we believe, is a shared responsibility. I mean, I guess inherent in that is, is at least some acknowledgement that foods have not been as healthy as they could be or should be. We're trying to change the products we make and how we market them, and we think we can be part of the solution. Can the industry police itself? Well, again, I would say judge us by our actions. Judgment has been favorable, but not completely. Critics point out the company still targets kids much younger than 11, bombarding them in stores with cartoon spokes characters. Clifford the dog, Adora the explorer. I mean, this is clearly aimed at a at very young children. Who's watching Clifford? Who's watching Dora? We know that there are concerns that people have about this kind of packaging and, and licensing program. We're going to continue to look at that. We're not seeing Dora the Explorer on packages of spinach. Again, we're, we're very on interested in, 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 in I mean, pursuing clear, a dialogue. Clear, you're, you're, you're promoting the less healthy end of the... Well, one of the, actually, one of the things that we intend to do is, as part of our overall effort in kids' marketing, is to introduce new products that meet our sensible solution standards. Those may carry some of the licensed characters as well. I hear what the company line is, but you know what I'm driving at, that this is just not the way to market food. Well, the way to market food is what we're trying to do with, for example, our TV advertising. That's our first step. We've taken steps on our websites, and this is probably the next frontier. We're going to be looking at this. So maybe it's goodbye SpongeBob SquarePants. You never know. No response to that. But Kraft has decided not to renew its licensing agreement with Dora or Clifford. Still, the food industry doing away with cartoon spokes characters altogether? Maybe a job for Superman. Change is also in the works for the company that helped invent fast food. Was it because someone turned up the heat? You changed your chicken McNuggets. Yes, sweetie. Was any of that change related to the lawsuit? When Food Fight continues. It's an American favorite, but critics of the fast food industry lay much of the blame for this country's expanding waistline on McDonald's. Tonight, in a rare interview, one of the top executives at McDonald's takes the heat Head on. When somebody says, eating at McDonald's made me fat, what do you say? I say, um, I eat at McDonald's quite often, um, and I don't consider myself to be the same thing. You know, I, I couldn't speak to why a person would say that. As McDonald's, we're not the cause of obesity. Don Thompson is the chief operating officer of McDonald's USA. He helps decide what 26 million U.S. customers eat every day. We met for a rare interview to discuss obesity, responsibility, and that McDonald's made me fat lawsuit. This lawsuit was thrown out mm -hmm. twice. It's now been reinstated. Were you surprised? Uh, very much surprised, but we're very hopeful it will be thrown out again. Remember, in 2002, two obese girls sued the fast food giant because they said they just couldn't put those burgers down. The first time that I heard the, the information about the lawsuit, honestly, I thought it was a hoax. I really felt like someone was deferring their responsibility and abdicating their responsibility personally. But do companies like McDonald's bear some responsibility at a time when obesity is a major problem in this country? Well, I think what level of responsibility we do have is to provide menu choice. It is not up to us to define what is a part of a person's diet. However, we want to make sure that the choice is there. So McDonald's is now offering more chicken entrees, salads as a meal, water in place of soda, and these fruit plates instead of apple pie. Supersizing is gone, as is the old formula for chicken McNuggets, leaner all-white meat, replacing what a judge once called a McFrankenstein creation. You changed your chicken McNuggets. Yes, we did. 
children love the Chicken McNuggets. We also know that moms are very concerned about and want their children to have the absolute healthiest thing that they could possibly uh, have. And so one of the things we wanted to do was to show moms we hear the concerns, we're listening and learning, and we made a switch in our nuggets to go to all white meat. Was any of that change related to the lawsuit? No, no not, none of the change that we made with our chicken nuggets was related to a lawsuit. McDonald's says it is constantly trying new products, new options, and new initiatives. We're not just about burgers and fries anymore. We're not your mother's McDonald's. Kathy Capica was McDonald's head nutritionist. We met at a suburban Chicago McDonald's. Are burgers and fries smart eating? Burgers and fries can be part of a healthy eating style. But can I eat it every day? Depending upon if you're active enough, you can eat at McDonald's every day. Our company cafeteria is a McDonald's, and many of us eat there every day. But are you eating hamburgers every day? Well, the thing is, is dietary guidelines suggest variety, moderation, and balance. So you're saying you can come every day, just, yeah. just mix it up. Right. During her years at McDonald's, Capica helped add several nutritional choices to the McDonald's menu board. None perhaps more successful than these small packages. Can I try these? By all means, help yourself. Apple, apple dippers. You will love them. They're fresh apples, uh, peeled and sliced. Well, tastes good. Tastes good. Apple dippers replacing fries in kids' Happy Meals have made McDonald's the world's largest provider of apples to children. But there's a catch. New apple dippers with fun caramel dip. All right. Let's have the caramel dipping sauce here. <laughs> and see the fun that you get dipping it in? It's great. The ingredients are corn syrup, sweetened, condensed, whole milk, high fructose corn syrup, a lot of sugar in this. How healthy is this? It provides energy, not a, not a lot of other nutrients. But once again, if that's going to help your child eat more apples, and it's fun, it's a treat. Better than French fries. You know, if you're looking to cut down on calories for your child, this is a better choice because it is lower in calories. If you're looking to try and get your child to eat more fruit, this will help them do it. Are you testing other fruit and veggie products? Yes, we've tested dozens of vegetables with children. They like none of them. But we're still working, we're very committed. But I think one of our bigger barriers is, is parental perception of vegetables at McDonald's. Moms have told us, I'm not going to come to McDonald's for vegetables. The overweight parents and kids we talked to echoed that. Some of these fast food restaurants say that they are now offering healthier items on the menu. Are you buying those items? You're going there for the fries. That's what they're known for, the fries. So that's what you're going for. If I went to McDonald's and I had to choose between a hamburger and a salad, I would pick the hamburger. It's what you know. It's what yeah, you've grown up that's doing. That's what I know. That's what I eat. Your critics say adding healthier choices is part of it. But you ought to either improve or replace the more fattening items on the menu. I don't think that I would want to tell someone who comes into McDonald's for a Big Mac, no, you can't have a Big Mac because we took it off because of our critics. But what if your customers are making terrible choices? What if they're choosing to come in and eat burgers and fries way too often? You know, as McDonald's, our role and intent is not to say you can or cannot have this. But what we have taken a leadership role in is to provide nutritional information and trying to get that awareness level up about balanced and active lifestyles. I'm burning calories like a fiend. I'm feeling good, I'm looking lean. In its marketing, McDonald's does stress balance and physical activity. The company's most famous icon has traded his clown shoes for running shoes. Well, Ronald McDonald is now on a nationwide campaign to talk about exercise to kids. I think it's a step in the right direction. I applaud that. All right? I don't so agree with that. Because Ronald McDonald was a spokesman for McDonald's. He's the one who made us fat McDonald's. in the beginning. Yes. Now he wants now to, he wants to exercise? exercise? I don't think this is working out at all. <laughs> Critics say if McDonald's really wanted to help people stay fit, the company would alert customers to the potential dangers of some of its more fattening items. One of your staunch critics, law professor Banzaf, says there should be warning signs on your doors that fattening foods can lead to heart disease and diabetes. Well, I, I wonder where, where we stop. At what point do you put labels on grocery stores? Do you hang the labels down cereal aisles? Perhaps a better idea, say nutritionists, is to require a calorie count on the menu board so customers can see how fattening an item is at the moment they decide what to buy. 
Over the years, McDonald's has put nutritional information in various places, from the web to the back of tray liners. This year, the food giant decided to push the envelope, or the wrapper, and display the calorie count on your order's packaging. But it's still after the purchase, not at the point of sale. A lot of good it does after you've already purchased your meal to see mm -hmm. what's actually in there. That's not when you need the information. Right. 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 And you need that information Before. when you're making your selections, right. right? Exactly. This is a touchy topic in the industry. When the restaurant chain Ruby Tuesday put a calorie count on its menu, sales dropped. The calorie count was largely abandoned. But the people who invented the Big Mac, perfected the drive through and introduced supersizing told us they are committed to change. You know, years ago, Ray Kroc, your founder, mm -hmm. was asked what products McDonald's would be selling in the year 2000. <laughs> he said he didn't know, just that you'd be selling more of them than anybody else. I don't think Ray had in his wildest dreams that today we'd be selling more than 300 million salads a year. Um, you know, I don't think he would have thought we'd be selling apples, you know, 54 million pounds of apples in the U.S. alone. Can good nutrition and good business go hand in hand in the fast food world? I, I absolutely believe they can. And while McDonald's wants to sell all the burgers and fries it can, the COO's advice to us? I do believe in moderation. Too much of anything is a problem. Too much of, it, too much of anything can be a problem. Even McDonald's french fries. Oh, I love McDonald's french fries, Stone. So you know what? What I'll do is I'll walk a little further, uh, I'll exercise a little harder, uh, and I'll run around with my kids a little more. So how can you and your children win the food fight? Is the answer in the food court, the basketball court, or the court of law? For some tips on what you can do and to learn more, log on to our website at dateline.msnbc.com. That's all for this edition of Dateline Friday. We'll see you again for Dateline Saturday night at a special time, 9, 8 central. I'm Stone Phillips for Ann Curry and all of us at NBC News. Good night.